Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, we have all the elected people participating. So, uh, you know, we, we really have the, the power of the people uh, now fully engaged. Joe, yeah. let us We're all set, sir. We are ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'd like to call to order the October meeting, the Board of Police Commissioners, uh, uh, somewhere uh, uh, in, uh, in your general area. If you know there's American flag, please stand in that direction and let's uh, start by, uh, as we formally do, we're saying the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance, Allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. And to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, with liberty justice, justice, and justice for, for all. For all. Good. Thank you. Uh, uh, Captain Race, again, uh, thank you uh, for uh, you, uh, for your uh, Zoom coordination efforts. Uh, uh, it's always uh, kind of uh, impressive when uh, it, it works the way it's, it's supposed to work. But, but thank you for your behind the scenes uh, uh, effort. Uh, uh, also uh, tonight, in addition to uh, our liaison uh, with uh, Al Goldberg for the Board of Selectmen, Ken uh, uh, Kaminsky, we'd like to welcome you uh, back. I know you've, uh, you've had a an ongoing relationship with the Board of Police Commissioners, and we very much appreciate uh, your willingness to to actively participate uh, again. So, uh, you know, yeah, welcome. happy to be here. Thank, Thank you very you. much for having me. Thank you. Uh, first, our order of business uh, is: uh, is there uh, a motion to accept the uh, September Board of Police Commission meeting minutes? A motion to make the motion. September. I'll Me. second it. Uh, uh, any uh, discussion, comments, corrections for the minutes? Uh, uh, Christy, I've got to tell you, the minutes are getting longer and more extensive uh, with with our uh, our uh, you know audio uh, meetings here. But uh, you know you you. You know, it, they are very detailed minutes. Uh, appreciate that. Any other, any changes or corrections to them? None here. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Minutes are accepted. Thank you. Uh, uh, Captain, do you uh, know if there are any members of the public who have signed in or requested participation? Chief yes, sir. Do you have one member of the public? Um, Ms. Lopes and her hand is up. Okay. I could, uh, I can allow her into the meeting if you're approved, sir. Yes. Okay. Maureen, can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Could, could you, uh, this is, uh, this is Ed Dowling. Could you please just identify yourself and your residence, please? Yes. So I'm Maureen Lopes at 25 Old Farms Road, Madison. Okay. Just, Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I found these very interesting. Um, I know the chief is going to be giving on an ongoing basis about the police accountability task force. I have listened to um, a number of their listening sessions. And I just wanted to share tonight what I was not aware of and I found very interesting is the issues around police and individuals with disability, that that testimony was taking up, I would say, as much time as um, individuals with, uh, with concerns who were uh, people of color. And so, and that definition, of course, of disability is quite extensive, whether it's an emotional 
or physical situation that sometimes um, interaction with police uh, can go sideways if uh, that individual isn't known to them, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to um, highlight that as a piece of learning that I've done and I intend to continue watching what is available on Zoom. Um, so thank you. Had you muted. Had you, had you muted. Of course. Uh, Ms. Lopes, thank you for your comments. Chief, is there any reaction, any amplification that you think is might be helpful? Well, in the case of Madison Police Department, uh, we have a lot of ongoing uh, crisis intervention training, and we actually are trying to get uh, the whole department uh, certified as we've had this discussion in the past. One of the key uh, uh, <clears throat> foundation of that training is identifying people with disabilities, particularly those with emotional or uh, uh, other health issues. Um, so it's uh, most well, certainly that is a piece of uh, the House bill, but I think there's also gonna be some modification in regards to where we go as far as MSWs or other social worker types intervention into the program. Right now that's still in the study phase, but I think you're gonna see a lot more of that, Maureen, Ms. Slopes, in regards to the police uh, uh, response to uh, somebody with a uh, uh, mental disability. Um, we have in the past, um, with the training that we've received has changed our approach. Um, I think you've been online when we've had the discussion on how we deal with uh, somebody having an episode of Asperger's or something to that effect. And after sitting down and calming down the subject, and, um, it was a much better response than what we've done in the past where they've been sent to an emergency room and perhaps combative. Well, and I, I think certainly that that's one dimension that has been talked about in terms of providing some other uh, supplemental community resources and the, and the way of uh, counseling and, and mental health initiatives. So I, I think that is uh, that is going to be an important dimension that gets explored as this Police Accountability Act gets uh, further reviewed and analyzed. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. So one, one, and um, Maureen, one more thing is that in our CAD or system, we, we put as much information as we can that we have available or that's been given to us when we go to certain households in regards to uh, people in needs or uh, people that may have uh, suffered from psychotic episodes. So we have that go before we go into the, the call. We've, um, we've been very, very somewhat very successful with that, but um, mm -hmm. it's always a, it's an ongoing project. It's uh, there's newer um, applications to it. I, I think we have to see where the study comes from actually and physically putting social workers into the police response. Right. Um, Chief, do those individuals often wear a, a bracelet, you know, identification? If, if it's, <clears throat> it may be more trickier than just saying I'm prone to heart attacks or something, I don't know. The answer would be yes, some do. Some have medical issues associated with um, uh, uh, other mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for us, obviously, when we respond to a, a home, that it may be a group home or a home uh, designated uh, as some of the residents are um, in needs. Yes. Uh, but somebody that is, gets under the radar that moves into the town, maybe in an apartment, we have, we have no idea about that. They're perhaps on medication for um, a, a mental condition or physical condition and they don't take the meds and we end up with an episode and we respond. Hopefully we're successful in how we mitigate it and that information we do enter into the CAD. So we have, if we go there again and a strong percentage of the time we will return numerous times to that household. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chief, uh, thank you. Um, why don't we thank move you, in? Thank, thank you, Marie. Thank you, Why don't we move into the Chief's report? Um, excuse me, Chairman Dowling, just um, real quick, a matter of housekeeping. I think we need to um, have a motion to approve the minutes from the special meeting also. There was a September 8th special meeting. You're right. Thank you for picking that up. And I, as such, I'll make the motion to approve those minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes that were included here for the special meeting, please uh, say aye. 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 
uh, minutes for the special meeting are approved. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I I, uh, I missed it, Mary Mary Lee. Uh, I appreciate it. Chief, back to uh, your your report. One moment, please. Hey, uh, good evening, all. Joe, you have to put uh, Miss Lopes back as a uh, attending. Um, I just sent you the text. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with our uh, financials. Um, we are where we should be at this uh, point. There was some increase in overtime, but a lot of that is related to COVID, and is going to. We are seeking reimbursement under um, the. Uh, is given to us by FEMA and uh, through the uh, governor's office. In the event that obviously that does not get reimbursed or get reimbursed entirely, that's something the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen will be taking up probably in the spring, I would imagine. Other than that, we don't have any uh, unusual costs or expenses. Any questions on the finances? I guess I'll just recognize that you guys are doing a fantastic job staying within budget and managing it as effectively and efficiently as you have, even through these very challenging times. So um, as the representative from the Board of Finance, I just wanted to publicly thank everybody for the great job that you're doing, not only out there in our community, but uh, also with the, uh, the finances of the department. So thanks very much for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, um, if there isn't any further questions, I'll go on to activity. All right. Okay, so this will be the uh, the next quarter report for the months of July, August, and September. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning of it. It should be in a, your handouts, which are actually were emailed to you. You have them available. But starting with alarms, in a three-month period, we had approximately 518 alarms that we responded to of the Alarms, uh, 911 hangups are 222, burglar alarms, 128, fire alarms, 61, wires down, 92, medical, six, and nine other. Hey, Chief, uh, I'm sorry, what page you on? Sorry, uh, it, it was an email, Ken. This oh, it's on the packet, I'm sorry, I apologize. No, well, we should, uh, yeah, I, I think. Well, it's we fine, should, it's fine. No, no, well. I think we should just make an effort to make sure it's included in the package because just given people's activities, everyone may not, you know, pick it up. But go ahead, Chief. I okay. It. We have. Okay. Perhaps next time I'll get it so we can put it on the screen because I get the feeling we're going to be doing Zoom meetings for a while. We'll do it as a page on the screen. Okay. So uh, suspicious uh, vehicles uh, called in a 90-day period, 81 rep person, 66. Criminal investigations. 368 involuntary committals, 30. Canine assist, 12. In custody arrests, um, 70. A lot of those are reduced based from mandates from the judicial department um, and the state's attorney's office in regards to incarceration of people or keeping people within the building due to COVID uh, issues. So that's greatly reduced from what the actual number probably would be. Uh, animal nuisance, everybody's home. So 122 animal, <coughs> animal nuisance, uh, three bites. Juvenile cases, we had 16 over 90 days. Uh, missing adult over 16 was one and under was one juvenile, both returned home. Uh, two juvenile referrals based on alcohol consumption. Fingerprint request, 161 over that uh, 90 plus day period. A majority of those are for gum permits. Uh, first responder as R1, that's the officer, oxygen and with <clears throat> Uh, defibrillator, approximately 499. Assist the other persons, 244. Other agencies, 121. What a vehicle accidents, we had approximately 83. Of the 83, with injuries were 23. Private property, eight. Six were car versus uh, animal. The others were fixed property without injuries. Um, motor vehicle enforcements, uh, 36 for motor vehicle arrests, 19 speed enforcements, DWIs, 11. Written warning 71, verbal warnings 22. 
total calls for service during that period were just under uh, <clears throat> subtotal were 1921 generated motor vehicle stops, 159 total calls for that three month period, almost 3,000, 2,926. Daily averages uh, 31, 32. Uh, Chief, uh, is the, am I reading this correct? That there were no cell phone or text, uh, cell phone or texting uh, uh, offenses noted? They could have been in the seatbelt or the cell phones, but that would uh, that, it'd be very difficult to get that breakdown. Unless you okay. physically read, read each and every uh, warning that was given. Okay, but it says no seatbelt or no cell phone or texting. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out whether are we are we educating the public or uh, is it just just that, that there really was a uh, that kind of absence. I mean that that had been one that you know had really uh, stood out uh, in, in previous years. Do we uh, is the public actually getting more educated about cell phones, or we just can't quite see into the vehicle? Do you really think that we didn't have any? I would assume, uh, my assumption is that uh, probably within the warnings is where you have the cell phone okay. and the uh, seat belts. Because with the cell phones, the fines are essentially astronomical now, exceeding $500, particularly for in the case of uh, more than one stop. Um, I think that we try to be, uh, I use that term kinder general, we give the warning, we stop, we need to tell them the reason for the stop. Um, majority of the people we stop on the cell phones are people with live within this town. So that's part of our discretion, that's what we do. Now I could break it down further, which would take, we'd have to physically read each and every one and I could ask uh, that we do that, um, but it's gonna, it's time consumption. Sometimes we, we don't get all the verbal warnings, we don't get all the, uh, the information that you would, would serve us putting it here on this paper. But I'll do that if you'd like. You, Chief, you mentioned that uh, multiple occasions with the same person re usually warrant a higher fine. And do you know it's how that, it's, hmm? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say if, if a person is a repeat offender and the fine is starting to really achieve a number that's gonna get somebody's attention, aren't we better off taking a run at the fine and just saying this is the fourth time we've done that and this is your fourth warning because they're obviously ignoring them. Well, it's a progressive fine to answer your question. Yes. And do the officers do that? We know if we stop Tom Carlich today and we stop him two weeks from now, we will know that if we stop him a year from now, we will know that because in our collect system, it will show up that you were stopped in the town of Madison and we'll break it down for the officer. But um, if it's in, if it's in the town of Madison and our CAD system will show that uh, Tom Carlage was stopped for a cell phone two weeks ago and he was stopped also a month or two months ago for the same charge. I believe that the officers then will issue a ticket. Is, is That's their training, way? but they still have that discretion. Okay. Is there a way that we can fine tune this for perhaps not next month, but maybe November because it'll take a while? to see if there is a, but the incidence of repeat offenders for cell phones and texting if and, and in relation to the tickets that are actually issued in the fine. Because as you as we all know, there are a lot more people in town now and now it's gonna to continue to be a lot more people. And the general concern that, that I'm hearing uh, is that as we get into the fall, which we never experienced this last year in February, we're gonna see the town getting dark at four we're gonna see people's tempers getting shorter at 3.30 in the afternoon and rushing around. There are several schools, districts that are in and are out. I just think from a public safety point of view, I'm not looking to financially burden anybody, but if we have any kind of repeat situation with somebody, I think it's time for us to impose the, the proper fine for that. Well, let me let me back up again and repeat what I said earlier. The police officers have the discretion. We're not taking discretion from them. If they stop somebody for a cell phone or speeding or wrong term or going through a stop sign, that's they're the ones that observe the violation or they're the ones that are going to uh, mitigate it. They have that authority within the statute. That's gives, as far as I, I, I cannot tell the officers um, I don't, want to, I don't want to influence their judgment other than proper protocol. 
Now, as far as breaking down, I have to believe only because I've done this for a while that we're stopping a lot more people than you see in front of that piece of paper for cell phones. If you stand by outside any school system, when people are rolling in to go drop off their kids or pick them up, almost everybody has a phone attached to them. Would it be, would it be in the best interest of public policy to have the officer go out there and start basically stopping those cars that are going to pick up their kids to school and not telling them that, we're, you know, I'm, 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 let me finish, even, sir. Not even suggesting so, that. Okay, well, uh, the officers have discretion and they see a violation, they, they enforce it. Um, as to whether they give a warning, a verbal warning, we document that in the, in the CAD system. But the breakdown further that uh, do we have some trend in the increase of cell phone? I think we're no different than Guilford or Clinton or any of the other towns. People that have children get on the cell phones. Other people use cell phones. Um, they have hands-free. Um, very few people don't have devices that have hands-free. We do encounter them. But I'm running a patrol of uh, 136 miles of road with four people. So the chances are we're going to grab everybody. There's going to be some spike in this. I, I don't see it. But, okay, we'll break it down further. Okay. And, you know, as, as far as the you, you mentioning giving the officers some direction, you don't want to necessarily include that in, in a general comment, but perhaps at roll call before a shift goes out, just saying something to the effect of, it is a difficult time in town for a lot of people. Please use your best judgment when it comes to cell phones. If you see, and we, re, if you see an offender, and we resolve it back through the CAD system to find some of the history, and this is the third or fourth time, and it's not in a school, and it's not coming out rolling slowly out of stop and shop, that perhaps this would be a situation where there might be some financial recourse to it. Well, let me, uh, yeah. Chief. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone is, is trying to usurp or second guess the judgment of, of the officers in terms of, of uh, their policing, whether it's somebody who rolls through a, a stop sign at three miles an hour or a cell phone. On the other hand, I think we've all had enough experience uh, that is different than a, a parent driving into the high school and being on the on, the, on her cell phone uh, to tell the child she's there. We've all had the experience of driving behind someone on 79 going, what in the world is this person doing? And so, you know, none of this is, is again, attempting to usurp, uh, intrude on the, on the judgment and the orientation uh, and the professionalism of, of the officers, but it, it is something that, as, uh, and I realize the difficulty with hands uh, free, how you, I don't know how you even notice someone's on a, on a cell phone unless sometimes uh, you see, even with that, they're distracted. But, you know, it, it certainly at, it, it, uh, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the afternoon when you see someone driving erratically, I, I presume uh, an officer who is either coming the other way or behind him it is going to be alert to that. And I guess the only thing, you know, I'm, I'm suggesting or we're suggesting here is, is, is maybe there's a, some monitoring in terms of cell phone or texting warnings. If you can break those out, it might be helpful just to, uh, even if it, at some point, uh, you know, we need to remind, uh, you know, people that, uh, you know, texting and cell phones still kill a lot of people. So anyway. <laughs> That information is out there, and DOT most certainly puts enough public service messages out there, and they were doing a lot of the uh, granting, the grants that were used to uh, do special special team enforcement, um, probably more applicable in state police because they have a lot more bodies to work with or a larger agency with a traffic squad. But one thing we try to avoid is we don't want people thinking we're out there putting people out on quotas. And with racial profiling prohibition projects, some of these, including cell phones, are going to be questioned as to whether we continue other than a safety, direct safety issue, meaning is officers behind the car, the car is weaving, you see the, the, the light illuminated against their cheek because they're, they're consumed on this phone call. And I could probably be willing to bet you dinner time, they're gonna take enforcement on that. But to sit there, like we're going to sit there and, and target people on cell phones when we have a lot of other objectives, which would meet what public policy should dictate we do. If, 
I'm going to leave with this. When they come upon a violation, they feel warrants and enforcement, they're going to do it. Nine out of 10. I could probably guarantee you that. Other than that, I think to make special teams on that, it's not going to happen. We don't have the personnel and we have to police by objective. So if there's anything else I can answer in regards to that, Tom? No, I didn't. But just to take exception to two of the things you said, I didn't say target and I just didn't say special exception. I just said if they see it and the system shows it's a repeat offender, I suggest we don't give them a warning. Okay, well, uh, that's for the operation, my operation. I'll make sure they enforce the laws, do what they have to do. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Are we any other questions on motor vehicle enforcement? Training. Training. Uh, right now, they're um, they just finished with, with the blue line trailer, and they were doing uh, <clears throat> live fire in the blue line trailer for real life uh, situation, situational awareness. They also did other training with in regards to uh, taser and capstan. Right now, they're going to be moving before the weather changes to additional shooting outside, and the uh, regional range we share with Clinton. Um, there's also uh, uh, they're doing most of the classroom online, including for myself and some of the executive officers, uh, which are requirements statutorily. I don't think we're going to see actual classroom return to Meriden or some of the other sites for a while. I think uh, until we get more direction from how we're going to handle COVID in the classroom. So right now, most of it is online. The officers are maintaining and keeping up with what's required um, from post. Mm -hmm. Joe, anything you want to add to that? I did, if there is, if there has been a very small opportunity for a few in-person classes, um, but it was like uh, Sergeant Rosati got to go to a supervisor class, but they put 20 people in a, a, you know, a room that could hold 100. So there's very few opportunities. Uh, we are seeking those out where we can. There has been online training being conducted, um, but it's been it's been kind of sporadic, so it's been a little hard to track at this point. But uh, yeah, we are trying to seek out those opportunities where they exist. If we can get some in person and everyone feels safe doing so, again, we want to keep everyone safe and healthy. Uh, Captain, can I ask you? I know one of the areas that requires ongoing training is the canine units. Are, is that been suspended as well? No, that's maintained. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, it's 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 interesting. Uh, one of the conundrums, if you read the uh, Police Accountability Act, is the requirement and expectations, and which are appear to be pretty well founded in terms of training. And we're in an environment where, you know, certainly the training is more challenging and, and difficult. And uh, you know, we're uh, I think we're battling some of the same. Uh, you know, school issues that, uh, you know, where you, you do learn from experiences and discussions in a classroom, and we're just not able to do that at this point. But uh, that that is going to be an element, certainly going into next year, that is absolutely going to uh, somehow need to be solved in a way that says, look at, the, you know, the key to s certainly some of these uh, law enforcement issues is the training, the training of the officer, collection of the officers. So it, it is it is not gonna go away. Good. Uh, monthly traffic report. That was, in, that was including your statistics, the accidents. Um, that, that, that role no longer will be handled by Brian Baxter, who retired as a Sergeant from the police department, although he's staying on as part-time. Um, Sergeant, <coughs> Sergeant Jeremy York has assumed those duties. Uh, statistically, he only had on one month's activity, but what I did was we uh, were able to glean the rest of the statistics which were put in that report that we emailed to you. Great. So is Sergeant Baxter officially retired? He is officially retired and he works part-time for the police department. His dog, is, his canine is retired. Okay. The unfortunate thing is that we can't recognize it publicly for, we're gonna hope, hope for the best come the fall, the winter. And perhaps we can, uh, Honor those that serve this town so faithfully. Okay. Uh, community calendar? Community calendar. Okay, so I have two events out there. 
I have the trunk or tree, which is uh, still, uh, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to do this. Uh, although we go to phase three, um, there are still is requirements and a dynamic to us doing it. Um, right now, we've had a couple of discussions on it. I had another discussion today with the chamber. Um, in consideration is uh, perhaps maybe moving it to the surf club and have it at a drive in. Um, and drive in for them to have, have the parents decorate the cars perhaps those that want to participate we're going to have to space them out so many feet everybody's got to be wearing a mask so we're just trying to get through the dynamic of that and see if we could actually pull it off and we really in our heart of hearts we want it done but um, we have to also comply with the law i know some of the other communities around us are, are also going to do it they're having the same challenges um, I, I think we're going to be able to do it uh, we're looking the night before halloween we're thinking about moving it to the afternoon to the early evening, um, more convenience and a, a better way to manage it. So um, I'll have more information on that in about a week so we can get the word out um, of the definite, uh, it's going to happen with the community. The second one is the um, Madison Pride Fest, which is gonna occur on the church grounds. Um, and right now they have 65 um, registered participants. There is a, most of it, Actually, all of it will be on the church grounds. Originally, it was thought that it was going to encompass part of the green. That's changed. Um, also, some of the uh, tent structures changed. So Meeting House Road will remain open. It will be on the church, uh, church property. And we'll have a couple of officers on bikes just to assist with any issues with traffic. Um, we see that possibly, probably is going to be uneventful other than a successful event for the uh, organizers. Yeah. All right, what's the date of that, Chief? I want to say 17th, Joe. 17. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else on the uh, oh. show, uh, Captain? Are we pretty well shut down for all the, you know, certainly a number of the major bike road races, those activities, have they, they pretty much been all suspended or delayed? Yes, sir. Everyone's tried to do a uh, virtual, including the JCs. Their turkey trot has gone virtual as well. I think, uh, you know, trying to see how it works. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully 2021, we can get back to normal. I mean, I know it's, it's a big loss for a lot of these organizations. So um, they're all trying to battle through it the way that they can, but everything thus from now till the end of the year, with the exception of those two events, Chief just mentioned, have gone uh, to virtual format. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chief, correspondence, I know. Uh, uh, in, in the handout, I believe there's correspondence from uh, folks that we have, we've had families uh, donate, continue to support and donate to the police department, um, mostly food items. Um, we've had uh, one correspondence for a, um, which involves a uh, donation to the canine fund, I think. Uh, Christy, you're on? We're here. I'm here, Chief. It's under new business. Okay. Uh, do you want to cover it uh, now since you touched on I guess we need a motion to accept this donation. Am I correct, Christy? Ed, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, you do. It's a $250 donation to the Canine Fund, and you do need a motion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mark Daly of 123 Boston Post Road. Uh, it's a $250 donation to the Madison Canine Fund. Uh, so uh, is there a motion to uh, accept this uh, donation? I move. I move. Second. 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 Okay. Any, uh, I presume there's no discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Christy, can we ask you uh, to uh, uh, draft, uh, as per our uh, practice, the uh, acknowledgement thank you letter to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Daly? Sure. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Uh, Chief, tra uh, traffic issues. Uh, is there anything we need to cover? We have a few. We have a few, but um, I just want to talk to some that were out there. Um, I believe we already somewhat 
covered the uh, neck road study that came back from uh, DOT. Uh, what, essentially what they said was the speed of 30 miles per hour up to Beach Avenue is acceptable. So that could remain the same. They spoke from Beach Avenue all the way up to and from Circle Beach, probably perhaps should be lowered to 20 miles per hour. Um, they asked for additional signage for a couple of the intersections there for compliance. Um, that's essentially what the report says. Um, those, the signage, I'm going to make arrangements to have that done and the reduction of the speed sign from uh, the uh, neck road. I believe we talked about it last time. Yep. Uh, good. Do, do, uh, do we need to acknowledge uh, back to those? Uh, I'm not sure what the process is. There was a, uh, as I recall, there was a request uh, from a neck road uh, resident and a number of uh, people signed a petition. Uh, what what is our practice of getting back to them? Oh, I I, I need I need for you, the board to um, concur that we'll make the changes to the signage on Neck Road, and we'll uh, also send a letter to the uh, folks that sent in the petition okay. talking about what our actions are. Is uh, any hesitancy on, on your part or on uh, the town engineer's part about moving forward with this, this signage? No, he was uh, one of the intersections. They have a stop sign and the uh, traffic does a stop on the uh, eastbound side. So I, I think that's a smart safety that we do that. It's just something through the years, oversight over signs they do have. There's brush that grows over it. So we're basically updating the signs. So we would have to, we would concur with on the recommendations of the state traffic control and um, my office is the LTA. That I, I see no problem with the 30 zone continuing and stopping at beach and then changing over down to 20 as you get through where the old lady in Mercy School was, then it proceeds to the curve by the Guilford line and Madison off, then you continue on to uh, Circle Beach. What do you think the uh, timing will be? Um, well, that's part of this discussion, and I have the, I'm happy that one of the Board of Finance members is on board tonight, so I could discuss. Uh, I would like to just, uh, John's very busy. There's a lot going on in town. There's a lot going on with, uh, they're going to start some other road projects. Um, so I have no problem doing it, getting the signage changed. Um, I We had the intersection where the golf course uh, cart path crosses uh, <clears throat> West Wharf and Surf Club Road. So what I did was I utilized um, the private contractor for the town um, who uh, came in and very quickly put in the crosswalk and put the signage for the carts. I probably would utilize them also. Competitively pricing um, without the labor, it probably is as the same expense, if not less, to the town. Um, another discussion to this is that I would like to probably when we present the budget in the fall is out of line for maintenance of signs and STC devices within town roads and we would manage that and we'd make the arrangements for the signage and our changes to be done without having to essentially we vote on it we approve it and then we send it to public works to um, essentially install the sign or change it but sometimes they are you know they got their um, their plates are full so it takes a delay so I think that if we agree on something, we should do it quickly. And um, I think the best way to handle it is I'll handle it out of this office. <clears throat> and I would heartily endorse what the chief suggests because having been involved in traffic for a while, some of these requests on the traffic log go back a very, very long time and they are just maintenance issues. And I, as, you, as I think we all know, I meet with John on a fairly regular basis and he seems to try and address it as best he can but it's an impossible chore. Mm -hmm. And had the chief and I not talked about the golf club crossing and he took it upon as a task, I don't think it would be done. And there are two incidents for Neck Road. One goes to June, one goes to July. If we endorse the chief tonight and endorse, endorse the motion to get it done, it's finished. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it goes back into the mix as part of somebody else's budget, part of somebody else's time. So if we have the, <coughs> excuse me, if we have the department willing to take this on, uh, I'm, I'm up behind it 100%. And you know, for whatever it's worth, I've gone out and we've had some conversations. I've gone out in the vicinity of Hammond Asset State Park when we've got reports about signs down. I've gone down and I've nailed up signs myself. 
you know, the sign might have been put up with a staple. Now it's up on a, on a post or a tree with six metal nails. So if somebody wants to get a little more aggressive to pull it off, but it's so much easier to get stuff done and then go back and explain it afterwards. So, I mean, I'm behind this a thousand percent. Well, Chief, it's, and Tom seems to make sense. Ken, uh, let me ask you, do you have any reservation in certainly going into the next budget cycle uh, for us to develop a, uh, a line item that has a signage traffic contingency fund and, and coming up, I, I think it would probably be a, a relatively modest amount, but to the, Tom's point, you know, it would be something that uh, would, would acknowledge that, look at this is uh, just given the size of the town, you know, if, if a stop sign goes down, it's something that needs to be replaced, uh, you know, pretty darn quick compared to some of the other, but it would certainly sounds like it would facilitate, you know, just the action without intruding into the uh, uh, town engineer public works department saying, you know, you've got to sign funds there, let's just get it done. Do you have any hesitation? I mean, assuming that there's no regulatory issues or anything from, uh, you know, a town reg perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I think we would just have to take a look at what the budget line looks like for the town for that type of signage and then just, you know, reallocate it over to the police department so that uh, Chief Drum can manage that much probably more effectively than, than, uh, than the town's doing right now. So, okay. Yeah. I, I, th I, I think it makes sense. I think for continuity, for closure on the issue, well, certainly when people send us letters and request traffic studies or agonizing on the issue, might not be a, as, as, as important to us, but it's important to us that a citizen has, has this uh, concern. I just think that it's easier for us to bring it to closure, get it installed. We've done it in the past, but it comes out of my budget line. There's only so many of those I can do before I deplete monies that were designated for something else. And, and I had to put off again what I needed to do. Um, yeah, but our I'll, finances I'll are. I'll bring it up on the next board of finance meeting, and I'll uh, see if there's any reason why we can't do that, and then I'll report back. Yeah, and, and I just think it's it's a simpler um, procedure for us, and most certainly we control it and we close it out. We bring it to closure for the I, people that are the people on the road I that live on the road or the neighborhood. Yeah, um, I agree. With and John's over. You know, there, he's got a lot of work to do, and and I, I've. I would rather just make it his life easier. And I've had this discussion with him. We go to on-site services, which is a subcontractor for the town. Um, they do a great job. They're very quick. And I think a cost analysis is, uh, you know, it's if you, labor and the installation is probably is less. You figure out, you know, what it takes to get it done on one side versus doing it commercially. Okay. Another example, Ken, in case you want one, was that the surf club this summer Several uh, warnings were issued for people parking parallel to the back of the volleyball courts, and they were issued a, a warning for no parking. However, there were, there were no, no parking signs there. It was just common sense, and the vehicles would be blocking any emergency vehicles. So I reached out to Scott Erskine, who uh, said he could take care of it, and John got the sign together. And I think the chief might have been involved as well. Within uh, a week and a half, we had three no parking signs and there have been no concerns since then. Okay, good. So Chief, do you uh, I presume uh, you may not need a formal vote, but a consensus approval to go ahead with the change in the speed limits uh, on Neck Road? I, I would, I need the consensus from the board that uh, based on recommendations from the state traffic control the state traffic authority to this uh, local traffic authority. Um, I think that it, it warrants it and we should do it. Great. Let, let's have a formal vote. All those in favor of, of the chief uh, implementing the state reviewed uh, uh, speed changes on neck road, please say aye. 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 We're good to go. Uh, Ken, Thank you. I think it would be helpful if we get that into the next budget cycle, that line account. It just seems to make sense. Uh, Chief, are there any other traffic issues? I have a couple other. And, and one is, um, it's rather, it's interesting. 
I've had a couple of, uh, well, one more I'm gonna, um, I also need to add signage to where Ridge Road goes towards the town uh, landfill from Green Hill. There's a stop sign there also that has uh, one, it's, it's traffic stops heading southbound, westbound, but traffic does not stop going eastbound and they then make a turn into Ridge Road. So one of the folks that uh, lives in that neighborhood had brought it to my attention and we looked at it and I think that warrants also an additional signage there that traffic does not stop. It's, it's not a, it, does not stop in the opposite direction, which you might see in some intersections as you drive around uh, the shoreline here. Okay. So that would now be a, a two-way or, uh, or three-way uh, on, on, on Ridge Road? It would be, uh, um, it's still a stop heading on, you come down Green Hill and as right. you come on to Ridge Road, it's a full stop there. Traffic that comes eastbound or northbound on Green Hill does not stop then. There's no uh, stop sign for them. So what's happening is people are starting to accelerate and people are turning in front of them. So uh, not that we've had a large scale of, uh, of accidents there, but it probably would warrant putting a sign traffic does not stop on the uh, okay. eastbound side. That absolutely makes sense in, in my opinion, but okay. And that, that was brought to our attention, uh, I, as I said, from the residents there. I spoke to them over the last few weeks, looked at it, and I think that that warrants it. And the, the expense is minimal. It's a sign. Okay. Okay. The next one has to do with private roads, which is probably more discussion. Um, Al, this is, uh, uh, since we first spoke, Al, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, um, I've talked to more attorneys, more attorney generals, uh, neighbors, uh, been down those roads. Okay, so on some of the private roads, uh, I'm getting complaints from folks that are walking like they always do down the road, a private road. Uh, they don't go into the private beaches, but they either walk or ride their bike or walk their dog. Some of them have been confronted by residents of the private roads. One association in particular put, up, put a sign at the end of the road saying, um, residents only. So it creates a uh, interesting uh, conundrum. Uh, I've looked at the deeds. Um, I've also spoke using uh, uh, one of the uh, um, zoning lawyers from uh, Floyd Dugas's firm. He concurs me, it's not in the deeds. We checked them, we do not see where there's some sort of exclusion to or preventing of folks walking on those roads. We also have public utilities on those roads. There's water, there's gas. And there's power lines. The road in particular is Beach Avenue. Beach Avenue, which then goes to Canoe, and I'm trying to think of the other road, but it escapes you right now. But um, we've been on that road as the police department. I've been there on a payload with a chainsaw, open it up with, with trees across the road, that public road. Um, so, and then some folks there that live on that road are letting their dogs run loose, which confronts some of the runners. Well, as far as the dogs and animal control, the, the rules don't stop or the laws don't stop in conjunction with the state of Connecticut or the town ordinances um, at the property line. Therefore, all folks that live in this town. They have all the authority, they, they, they have all the authority in their own person, in their own property, their own uh, residence. As far as the passage through the, the road of a private association, I think they're gonna be very difficult for them to preclude people from entering that property to take a walk or ride a bike. They can prevent them from the beach. The beach is a private, it's posted, we get that point. I don't have anything in the deed that has that exclusion. Um, the last piece of property I came up with was a transfer, um, Martha Stewart to uh, a, a gentleman out of, De out of Washington, uh, correction, New York. Um, and that was more for access into the beach road. So um, I think that and I've had the discussion with folks and Al also you're in some of my discussion. I think that I don't have any law that's contrary to allowing those folks to walk on those roads. And a lot of the court decisions, and I think this is one of these cases that's like whatever the last decision is, is what they, they'll refer back to for research. Um, what I read from some of the decisions, the judges bring up that, do you have utilities? Do you have uh, this? Amazon or UPS make a delivery to your house? Does the town respond with emergency vehicles? 
So unless somebody comes up with something contrary that tells me different, I, I think that these folks should allow these folks, uh, the people that are riding and walking, doing their daily walks on the road and not um, try to interfere or confront them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do all my professors to do questions, comments, observations. Well, if the law is on the side of the walkers, how do we, how does one communicate that to the residents that unless they want to sue the state or, you know, take it up with the state and, uh, you know, law is not my area. So just based on what you're describing, what would be the next, what would be the town's next step? I, I believe it's going to result in myself going down there and having a discussion with some of the neighbors that are more aggressive with it and trying to reason it and explain it out. And unless they have something they could show me different. Can, what can I'm trying to avoid is a confrontation. Um, I'm trying to avoid a confrontation. You know, people's emotions running high on this. Well, it is so. The, the I'm sorry. So the the, compl the complaint is on some of the private roads. People are walking down the private roads or riding the beach down some of these beach association roads where the beach associations have the responsibility for paving, plowing. Um, in, this in this particular case, it's uh, Beach Avenue, um, Pleasant, and to Canoe. And then I believe there might be, there's, there's a, it looks like a uh, um, land trust property in, which has an overgrown path, which looks like it's one of the back ways into towards the beach. Well, but once again, I have to rely on what we have in zoning to research that. You know, I spoke with John Delora a great uh, many times and um, trying to ascertain what is in the deeds. Or what it, it's very vague. Mm -hmm. well, well, can I make a comment? Sure. Can anybody absolutely. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I were a homeowner and I owned a road or part of a road, and people were walking on it, I would be concerned for my liability. What happens if, you know, I didn't shovel the road well enough and somebody slips and falls? I mean, there's a big liability issue here. So I, I can, you know, understand the position of the homeowners. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised to hear that the law is pointing in the other direction that the walkers have the right to go on private property. Mm. Well, I, I think the, the question that was raised and um, that I that was <clears throat> I read most of the um, decisions that were there had to do with is it used exclusively by residents or is it used by services, emergency services, utilities, deliveries, um, your oil truck or electrician, things like that. So, right, but those are people that the residents want to come to their property. Right, right. It's not some random person. I mean. It, it's a very different scenario. If, if you call an ambulance or an electrician, even if you don't have a private road, they drive onto your property because you've invited them in. Mm -hmm. Not that I have a dog in this fight, but I agree with Marietta. If the life, just from a liability perspective and a common sense perspective, if, if there's going to be potential uh, risk through that liability to the homeowner, and everyone knows how litigious our society is, uh, I, I would, I would have concerns as a homeowner as well. I think we need to do a little more research on this or just confirm that I, I, I'm very skeptical of the opinion that the walkers can go wherever they want. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm a lawyer, but it, you know, this is not my forte property law, but it just seems wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But Mary does have a, it might require some level of posting, you know, uh, which is just what we need, another sign, but it might require some definition of, of uh, some not invited on your, uh, your property. Uh, well, it sounds like they've already put a sign up and it's not our responsibility to put the sign up. It's the property owner's responsibility to put the sign up. That's correct. And they could post it. They could co they could post a no trespassing, which would result in a criminal trespass. 
Is it that's the answer? I mean, it almost appears yes. to be too simple, but if it's private property and they own the, the area and they put up a no trespassing sign, doesn't that spell out what you have to do? Just well, because very... the people have been walking there for years doesn't mean that they have the right to continue to walk there. I'm trying to get a clear cut definition through legal counsel and I can't seem to get it. So I think what I'm, tr I'm trying to mitigate is people fighting on the street over it, prevent it. So um, that's why I think it's worthwhile having a, having a discussion with the folks. Maybe they could help us with some sort of documents or something. Um, How many houses are actually involved in this, Chief? Oh gosh, there's, I think there's probably 18, 19 rentals. Of the 18 or 19, how many of the individual owners are, are, are raising this concern? Is it all of them as a group? Small group. Small group out of the 18. Yeah. Um, well, but I, 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 may, I think it's worthwhile to circle back uh, to whether it's town council or appropriate legal uh, council is, raise the question of, to Marietta's point, of liability uh, in terms of is that, uh, uh, do, do you still have a liability uh, in, in view of any or no sign of what, uh, so it, it, to Marietta's point, I, I think we need to get a couple more uh, more in-depth opinions on the liability uh, for this. Um, and let's be careful how we tread here because there's lots of private roads all over Madison, many down by the water. I and do. so while this is an isolated complaint, it will um, it, it will resonate far and wide right. how we handle this. Yeah. Uh, Marietta, I, I think you're absolutely right. And then the next thing it's going to be, well, the blue stickers are for this road, the yellow striped stickers are for that road, and the green stickers with the, uh, with the star is for the third road. So, I, you know, I just assume not have the police department into, you know, the kind of gatekeeper for, for nine private roads, you know, in town. So I think it's worth, you know, another uh, and a little a little deeper dive, at uh, least to get an opinion. And and of course, uh, you know, we, we heard this go you know, just it, the second cousin of all the on Middle Beach Road. Why do you let these people on Middle Beach Road? They don't live. Here. So I think it's going to be helpful to try to sort this through a little more before we head into the summer season. Uh, for next year, yeah, I, I, I gotta. Um, I'll be talking with council uh, not tomorrow. I think you ask me to call back next week on Tuesday uh, from uh, uh, Burgess Mosum and see what they say, um, what he came up with. But I'm just trying to uh, have these folks. I, I, I'm trying to avoid a confrontation. So, and I know these folks are very passionate about it on both sides. So, we'll, we'll uh, more research. Thank you. But they give you your input. All right. Uh, while we're on traffic, uh, Al, can I just ask you a question? You may be tuned into this. Uh, at one point earlier this summer, we were a little startled here from uh, uh, the town engineer that uh, uh, Middle Beach uh, Road was paved the 4th of July, as I recall. And that was. Uh, I think, uh, uh, cooler head that you, you know, given all the beach issues we have, you really don't want to pave Middle Beach Road on the 4th of July. Do you know whether that is a plan to pave Middle Beach Road? Yeah. I, I, you're muted, I think. There. Al? That was a great answer, Al. Thanks for giving it your approval. <laughs> Al? 
So, I mean, it's, 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 it's not an immediate issue in front of us, but I, I just recall the plan to repave, you know, one of the more town was uh, at least, as I recall, deferred. Do you know if it's, uh, I would assume that would come up at the Board of Selectmen meeting as well? Well, it hasn't come up to us yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, at some point, the asphalt plants are going to say, that's it, folks. So, you know, may, stay tuned for next year. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I may add just a comment, yeah. uh, my new right hip is about a week old, and it's sat down for about as long as it's supposed to. So if there aren't any specifics for myself, I'd like to excuse myself and go stretch it out. And Tom, thank you for your effort. And uh, even if you lie on the floor, we won't be able to see you, but we could still hear you. But if there's there's a more more appropriate place to rest, we understand completely. Thanks for your participation. Good luck with your recovery. Well, lying on the floor would be a throwback to things from years ago, and I don't do that anymore. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I think we've... Uh, We've uh, hammered the traffic issues to the full extent. Uh, uh, and also, I, 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 uh, Chief, just moving on, uh, are there any current issues under new business or would you like to cover the, your engagement with the Police Accountability Act? Uh, I know that's under old business, but certainly that's something that uh, uh, continues to evolve. Uh, maybe it'd be helpful to combine those issues uh, at this point. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll talk to uh, updates on uh, the uh, Police Accountability Act. Thank you. House Bill 6004. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I sit on uh, the subcommittee, and I guess I'm a permanent member for the Racial Profiling Prohibition Project. Uh, the Police Transparency and Accountability Task Force has asked, requested, charged us with the establishment of primary and secondary traffic violations of the general statutes, that would be your cell phones, and the establishment of requirement in the general statute that any police traffic stop must be based on the enforcement of a primary traffic violation. So what they're asking us in general is look at all the statutes, um, ones that are compliance, uh, they won't have that, um, that's not a safety issue uh, for the most part. Uh, if an officer stops a vehicle for speeding and there's secondary violations such as uh, a compliance, tinted windows, um, that, that would, the officer only writes the infraction for the, the speeding violation, that the other violations um, would then be become administrative, meaning is that's something they would he would report it in when he uh, issued the summons, but it wouldn't take any enforcement on it. That would be up to an administrative uh, duty in the motor vehicle department. So what they're doing is we're looking at all the uh, statutes, and you can imagine what they are. Safety ones, ninety percent of the safety ones are going to remain untouched. Stop sign violations, speeding, unsafe lane change, following too close, things things in that nature. So. We've had one meeting already. We've identified uh, essentially over 400 statutes that we have to um, go through. We've broke them down to a priority, primary, and then secondary, then one is more compliance. We have to report back, it does sunset, it has to be available for the spring uh, session of the General Assembly so that they can enact this into law. So there, um, it's very diverse, the group that sits on this subcommittee. It's also a member of the governor's office on the subcommittee. So it's racial profiling project folks out of Central. There's the different caucuses representatives and of course CHRO um, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Civil Liberties Union. So I can probably answer a few questions if you have them in regards to this. Um, as, this is still fluid. We're, we meet tomorrow at one o'clock and generally there are a few hours the meetings and we try to focus this down and get it uh, complete our task that was requested of us by state government. Yeah, you're on mute. 
I know. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. The, uh, how uh, many members uh, of the task force are law enforcement officers? I'm the, I'm the permanent member. I don't represent the, C, the, the uh, Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, although I'm a member, I'm not representing them. <clears throat> I'm the law enforcement uh, chief that's been asked on by the uh, program director. Um, and that's based on when we worked with them over the last two years, they um, want to continue the relationship they've built with the Madison Police Department, most certainly with this office. The CPCA has two legislative representatives that are police chiefs that um, occasionally make the meetings. Okay. There's also the two with law enforcement. Um, criminal justice is also sits on the on it. Uh, Mike Gaylor from GA9 in Middletown, he sits on it as well as a representative out of Chief State's Attorney Colangelo's office. These are important. They'll be sweeping changes, so they have to have all that input. No. Do, they, do you have a deadline uh, or a target date to complete your evaluations and to issue a report? A lot of it is conjunction. It was outlined in the House Bill 6004. And um, there is a timeline at sunsets, I guess, would be the term uh, within six months so that the, they could take it up in the spring. You know, they're, they're, a lot of the uh, laws that we see on the books were pushed um, hypothetically by the insurance industry through the 80s and 90s. So, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some sort of pushback from lobbyists on this. Mm -hmm. Some of it's warranted. Like I said, 90% of the safety is going to remain untouched. You still have to, you still have to enforce um, violations that would affect the public safety of people, whether they're walking down the road, riding a bike, or driving. Mm -hmm. uh, are, they, are they touching on uh, individual officer liability as yet, or is that? still to be discussed. So, um, repeat that, Ed. The individual officer liability. At one point that was being actively uh, considered uh, someone ability <clears throat> to be a police officer. My understanding is that um, immunity and um, use of force are gonna be taken up again. I think that um, there's a, a group, a strong group of legislators on both sides of the house that uh, would like to take it up again. Uh, in lieu of information, they know now that they did not consider or know prior to the vote. Um, it was interesting to see that some of the publications cited the, uh, um, the legislators that came to our presentation here in Madison about a month ago. They pointed that out recently. Uh, I think the Register did the other day in the Hartford Current. And there was a discussion between, I think it was uh, that discussion with Senator Needleman from Essex, who covers up the uh, Central Connecticut shoreline, and uh, the uh, challenger to him uh, from Westbrook. Okay. Well, so, I, uh, I, I think it's very helpful that you're participating. Uh, you know, I think there's always a, uh, uh, I, I recognize it's an investment of your, your time. Uh, away from a pretty demanding uh, role as it is. But it also, I think, is helpful to hear the discussions and evaluate, even if something uh, does not get uh, fully enacted, are there things that we might consider as an agency because it just makes good uh, police sense to do. So I, I, I'm, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, very helpful for you to to participate, uh, you know, this is a this certainly was a headline kind of uh, issue, as we call when it was passed. And I think the fact that it's uh, being analyzed and people are doing a deeper dive into it, it also uh, also makes sense. So I'm, I'm glad it's unfolding in a little more thoughtful way than uh, you know being slammed through the legislature after you know four days of discussion. So I. I think, uh, I think it's going to be helpful to see uh, what comes out of it. Listen, I, 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 I'm really passionate about it. And I, I, you know, after being all these years in law enforcement, I think people would think I'd be the opposite. I'd be hardcore on all things enforcement. But I've watched this change through the General Assembly through the years. And at one time, I was a lobbyist for the state police of the Capitol. I've watched it. 
and was to myself saying, what are you doing? You know, there's a lot of influence in the insurance company. Obviously, something's good, but, you know, I always use that example. We stopped a guy or a gal coming over down the connector during the summer doing 75 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour down the connector. And we're just trying to slow down traffic before they cross the uh, Route 1 at a high speed and there's a bike, someone on a bike or pedestrian. We've had our accidents there, but our enforcement there has reduced that reduce the high impact collisions. But we stop somebody for doing 70, 75, you pull the car over, then you find out that there's compliance issues, equipment violation. Um, somebody didn't pay their taxes on their car in, in a town somewhere else in the state. And the states have the right to do an enforcement where they suspend, as I've explained this before, registrations or the right to drive. And you have a car load of folks that are going to the beach for the day and now they're not going to the beach and we're towing their car and uh, it, it's, I think there's a better way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you could have the argument, well, they didn't pay their taxes, but listen, our job's not to be tax collectors, nor is it to put roadside punitive uh, uh, judgment on people. Public safety is number one. We enforce the laws, we get that. But I think that some of those changes, most certainly equipment have to, have to be looked at. And you have to also remember the majority of these stops if you took the equipment stops off the out of the equation, uh, racial profiling prohibition study study on this, and not just the state of Connecticut, probably across the country, we probably wouldn't be gathered in the room on um, on that subject. It, it's a lot of the equipment, a lot of the uh, compliance affects people that have that social economically cannot afford, mm -hmm. and they're trying to do the right thing. So you stopped for us. So listen, that memory is right there. I, I've stopped my share of cars with two or three car seats in the back and a car that maybe needs some repair. You know, when somebody's trying to get to the work, get to work on time and they're trying to do the right thing. And am I putting a ticket on them for several hundreds of dollars, which is going to change the way they feed their family or, or affect the, whether they can make the rent or their mortgage payment that, you know, it, it's not, it needs to be looked at. Okay. And finally we're there. So I believe in that. And I think that's a lot of, maybe my contemporaries, some don't share that. But I think that um, at some point in the General Assembly years ago, they thought this is a good way to balance the budget. We'll just tax people and get money on this. Cops don't want to be tax collectors. You know, it's a very unpopular role. Our job is safety, motor vehicle responding, responding to people in need. So I'll stop on that uh, soapbox there. Al, you're smiling. But I mean, it's how I feel, you know. I don't like exclusion. I think that we you know, we do have laws that do that. Hey, well, look at it. Uh, please keep us informed, and uh, it, it's a, it's an important uh, participation uh, group to to be part of. Um, I think we covered uh, the correspondence. Uh, Commissioner, comments. Uh, No comments. Uh, Ann? No comments. No comments. And, and I think I've talked uh, enough for this, this evening. So uh, I, I think with that, uh, uh, we, uh, we are concluded. Is there a, a motion? Uh, there's no reason for us to go into an executive session. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. I move. Oh, I'll second. I second it. That was the quickest <laughs> I got all night, I got to tell you. Uh, and the most enthusiastic one I got. So uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. We, aye. This meeting is adjourned. Uh, thank you very much. Al, thank you for your participation again. Uh, your hip clearly outlasted Tom and uh, Ken Kaminsky. Uh, uh, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, what there he is. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 